Well, I mean, first you have to understand is that Magna Carta is probably the greatest and most beneficial unintended consequence in history. You know, you've got a bunch of hooligans, really, <laughs> barons, uh, demanding their rights from a hooligan king. And uh, really, it's just that central idea that there is such a thing as uh, a right to justice and such a thing as justice that really sort of comes through it all. Uh, and people who talk about Magna Carta um, I mean, very often don't know the clauses. I mean, most of us can't memorise or haven't memorised the clause. Uh, but they do have this concept of English justice, as it was then, uh, English justice coming down through the, uh, through the centuries. So it's that, one thing else. It's, it's an inchoate, incoherent almost, but very, very important feeling that uh, everybody has a right to justice. Well, let me start with a comparison. I mean, it always, it always amuses me that the, um, the, the, the monument, as it were, was paid for by the American Bar Association, not by an English institution. And the, in many ways, America takes its constitution far more seriously than we do, because it's written, it's taught in schools, everybody understands it, everybody treats it seriously. The recent Edward Snowden revelations cause far more resonance in America than they did here. And so one of the things I think which, one of the opportunities available to us next year is that we can increase the level of awareness of ordinary British citizens, particularly younger ones, uh, of, of the importance of our our structure of rights, our structure of justice, our structure of democracy and how they and how they play together because we don't think about it enough. We absolutely don't give it enough attention until something goes horribly wrong, then everybody pays attention. So it'd be a great focus for that idea and hopefully it will be a stepping stone for, uh, for more continued uh, uh, interest and knowledge of uh, the British Constitution. Uh, recently, uh, in all the fuss about the state surveillance, there was an article by Hugo Rifkind, which I commend in the Times, which I commend to all of your uh, students, because his father was a man who runs the Intelligence Security Committee, he ends up often acting effectively as the spokesman, Malcolm Rifkind acts as the spokesman for the spooks, for the, for the agencies. Uh, and Hugo said in his article something very interesting. He said, "Oh, you know, no doubt we we have to have people carrying out surveillance on us. We no doubt have to have people protecting us from terrorists and, and criminals and so on." He said, "But the trouble is, uh, in things like surveillance, nobody over forty really understands it, because for them this is about intercepting telephone calls. For us, it's spying on our whole lives." So my point to your to your debaters, as it were is that justice is a living thing, freedom is a living thing, privacy is a living thing, and it should relate to your daily life and what's important to you. And so the ability of the state to look at the internet is, uh, is very, very different today than it was 25 years ago when it didn't exist. Um, and, and so uh, make the thing relevant your daily lives, make it relevant to what you think is important, um, because that's what it's about. I mean, that's where we jumped from the forestry <laughs> you know, uh, issues uh, and the rights of, of barons uh, uh, 800 years ago to what matters, because that mattered to them then, uh, to what matters to you today. Make it alive, make it uh, relevant, make it applicable, make it important to yourself, because that's what will make it live. I mean, very often, um, where well, the two dimensions to the answer really, very often people pose liberty against security, and and, and there's a the scene there's a sort of tension there. Now, famously, Ben Franklin uh, said that you know those who will give up uh, their liberty for a little extra security deserve neither liberty nor security. You know, and what he was po what he was doing when he was cutting through that that tension between, and, and, and pointing up really that often, you know, if you're not free, you're not secure either, you know. 
But nevertheless, there are times when this issue comes up. I mean, I was Shadow Home Secretary in the immediate aftermath of 7-7. And no doubt, the public at large were afraid of uh, what might happen next, that we might have more of them. You know, we might have a 9-11 or whatever. Now, what we had to do was to decide how much we conceded of our freedoms. And the starkest and most uh, high profile and controversial issue at the time was Tony Blair wanted to introduce 90 days detention without charge. In other words, you could be in prison for three months not even knowing why you were there. That's the thing to remember. You would not even know why you were there because nobody told you the charge. And we, uh, we fought that and defeated it. Was a it was Blair's first great, great, great defeat and that was essentially my operation. But in order to do that, we also had to make a decision. Is there, and at the time, you could be detained on terrorism offences for 14 days without charge. Um, now, the reason you're detained without charge is so the government, the agencies, can gather together evidence to, to prove exactly what you've done wrong, whether it's build a bomb or plot to bring down an airline or whatever. And at that point, there had been one case when it had got to 13 days before they found the evidence, right? So there was a lot of fear, so I said, okay, we'll let it go to 28 days. Not 90 days, 28 days. Now, the truth of the matter is, that was because I thought I could defeat 90 days with 28. I didn't think I could defeat 90 days with 14. Um, what happened later on proved that actually we didn't need the 28 days either. The subsequent cases that came up Everybody who was kept till 27, 28 days was innocent, you know. So, uh, but there was a real practical example. Would we put people's lives at risk by giving every terrorist suspect uh, the right to be released after 14 days if no charge was brought? Um, and we made decision going one way, and now that decision has been reversed. The early, early years of this government, the very first thing they did virtually was to bring it back from 28 to 14. Uh, based on the evidence that I dug out when we looked at how the 28 days worked. So there's a clear tension there. But today, when those tensions are raised, I, my first stopping point is Franklin, you know, is, is Ben Franklin, and say, well, is there really that tension? Does it really make it more uh, safer? Uh, does it make your life more safe um, if you give away freedoms or privacy? Today, the highly topical case, of course, is the Snowden revelations, the NSA, G GCHQ uh, interventions in our life. My view today is actually, if they collect too much data, vast and vast amounts of data, they actually cripple themselves. So they, don't, they actually worsen security rather than improve it. So to, again, talking to your, to your, uh, your debaters, I would say to them, um, the first thing to check is that actually you are buying more security. It's not always worth doing, even if you are buying more security or giving up liberty or privacy or whatever, but it's never worth it if it's not really adding real security. And there are always people who will argue for erosion of privacy, erosion of freedom, erosion of your rights, uh, and they'll use security arguments. Always challenge them, always distrust them, always make sure that they're for real before you even think about giving up uh, a my, uh, an iota of privacy or a day of freedom. Well, I think most of it will arise from the technological powers of the state. Uh, and it will be more about privacy than about, um, about than directly about freedom, but, but it'll be about both. Uh, the the simple truth is that it, uh, 25 years ago, when I was first became parliamentarian, if you wanted to monitor somebody's um, telephone calls, for example, um, there would be a legal process and so on. But then eventually a little man in, in a blue overalls would go and attach some crocodile clips to a couple of terminals in a uh, telephone exchange somewhere, and then they could record what went on. Today, from my computer, I could monitor a thousand people a million people, 50 million people, um, uh, and store it all too. Now, 
so the, 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 there is no natural limit, as it were, to the power of intrusion of the state. Now, President Obama, uh, a few weeks ago, said just because we can do it doesn't mean we should do it. And that's a very, very good uh, line to remember as well. But very often the state, if it can do something, will do something. Uh, as we sit here today uh, doing this interview, um, there is a case breaking uh, about the National Health Service database. What we found in the last day or two is that it's not just going to be available to doctors and medical researchers, it's going to be available to the police, it's going to be available to the cabinet office. Now, why? You know? But that's the state doing something because it can do something without necessarily having a reason. So that'll be a big argument. That will go on. Um, the, other, the other big freedoms issue, I suspect, will come out of the aftermath of the battles with terrorism and the foreign wars that the major Western countries have gone in for. Not directly, but indirectly. There will be a lot of things that the governments don't want in the public domain. So recently in Britain, for example, we've, ag we've agreed, uh, over, over my protests, to uh, what they call closed material procedures, they're secret courts. Um, and these are quite small, they don't affect many people, but the raw truth is that if you steal freedom from one person, you're stealing freedom from everybody. If you steal justice from one person, you're stealing justice from all of society. And there'll be a lot of those edgewise, apparently minor, but actually quite serious erosions of individual freedoms and rights. Uh, off the back of um, people actually mostly not being venal, not being dictatorial, not being totalitarian, uh, but being... Um, uh, seeking to cover up mistakes and past errors and, and, and uh, justify themselves. When I was in America about a few weeks ago looking at the, uh, the Snowden revelations, uh, one of the uh, intelligence specialists there said, America is not a totalitarian state, it just has all the apparatus. Yeah? Um, and I often say, you know, Britain is not a police state but if it were it would be too late to do anything about it so you've always got to think ahead you've always got to um, make sure that you don't get to a position which you can never recover from uh, and sometimes we do take that risk you must never let Parliament be the arbiter over somebody's individual outcome um, because there will be possibility of political considerations, possibility of tyranny of the majority, if you like. Um, uh, and that's a bad thing. I mean, you shouldn't allow politics, as it were, to determine the fate of an individual. Um, so for that reason, it should go to the courts. And it should go to the courts with proper rules, not rules around... And indeed, if we, if we wrote laws today which impacted on one person, those laws get struck down. Because because they're not they shouldn't our constitution, in as much as it exists, doesn't allow that. So it's perfectly proper for courts to make the decisions. Uh, it also distances itself from political pressures and the things that can lead to repressive behaviour. The other side of the coin, however, is that if the courts continually make the wrong decision, then in the in the mind of the public, then Parliament will change it uh, and change the rules. And that balance has worked well for us for centuries. Um, and will continue to do so. I mean, in a, in a way, to think back to Magna Carta, what Magna Carta was about was rebalancing the powers between the various parts of the state um, and uh, ensuring that uh, the Crown in particular didn't oppress anybody with it by denying them justice and so on, or delaying their justice. Uh, the, same, the same balance applies today. Today it's really between the executive, the government, parliament, and uh, the courts, and the most important thing is that the balance exists rather than who's most powerful. Massively so, massively so. Let me, let me tell you a little personal parable that relates to this. Some years ago, I uh, resigned my seat and forced a by-election. And many people didn't really understand why I did that, but let me explain exactly why I did. What was happening was the government was trying to push through, at that point, 42 days detention without charge. 
One of the reasons the government was doing it was because the public at large was uh, liked it. 72% of people, when asked, said, yeah, of course, 42 days detention without charge is right. Now, the reason they said that was because they hadn't thought about it. They didn't think that the person was not necessarily a terrorist, was a, was a suspect, and therefore quite possibly indeed more likely to be innocent than guilty. And so the reason for the by-election was to force that debate in the public mind. In the public mind. What happened was the public went from 72% in favour of the policy to 70% against it in four weeks. Big change. Um, and the government then eventually backed down. Whereas if, the, if, uh, if, uh, the, if it had been a popular policy, they wouldn't have backed down. And what that demonstrates is that the roots of our justice system, the roots of our democracy, the roots of our freedom, lie with the people, not with the government. You know? um, there's another, there are a number of other examples. Um, the, you may not remember who I mean when I, say, when I talk about a man called Clive Ponting, but he was prosecuted uh, under the Thatcher government for, for releasing information on the uh, torpedo of the Belgrano. He was prosecuted under the Official Secrets Act. Technically, he, he was guilty of the breach of the Act. But the jury decided this was a political trial and they weren't going to put up with it. And they threw out the case. Uh, and so he was exonerated. Now, the two examples demonstrate to you that actually what matters at the end of the day is not what people in this building think. What matters is the people they represent. And what you're doing is creating a community of understanding which will inform another generation so that our freedoms will be as strong then as they are today.